Sermon 4, February 3rd and 5th, 1916. You dead ones, I had to interrupt my address to you. What else do you want to hear? The following night, the dead came running sooner, filling the place with their mutterings and said, Tell us about gods and devils. This begins Sermon 4. God is the highest good, the sunum bonum, the devil the opposite. But there are many high good things and many great evils. Among these are two devil gods. One is the burning one, the other the growing one. The burning one is Eros, in the form of a flame. It shines by consuming. The growing one is the tree of life. It greens by heaping up growing living matter. Eros flames up and dies, but the tree of life grows with slow and constant increase through measureless periods of time. Good and evil unite in the flame. Good and evil unite in the growth of the tree. In their divinity, life and love stand opposed. At this point, I will take a pause as there is much to unpack. As Jung begins with the highest good and its opposite, he says there are many goods and evils. Before commenting on the two devil gods that Jung introduces, I want to remark on what Jung means by devil gods. A devil god would be an eternal force in the world, something real, specific to itself, and collective. When one reflects on this, you can easily see how these devil gods are the monads that Plato and Proclus spoke on, or in Jungian terms, the archetypes. We know how each archetype is eternal, unique to its own essence, and collective to all. Now, while the sunum bonum and infima malum, or the highest good and lowest evil, represent two major archetypes of life, two more are presented. These two unique devil gods presented, both equally good and evil, are Eros and the Tree of Life. Both represent real forces in all of us, and with some further elaboration, one may come to see the essence that the symbols represent. First, Eros. To start, there is a footnote which centers on this specific Eros symbolism Jung is referring to, as without much effort on my own, Plato re-enters the sermons. In 1917, Jung wrote a chapter on the sexual theory in the psychology of the unconscious processes, which presented a critique of the psychoanalytic understanding of the erotic. In his 1928 revision of this chapter, retitled The Eros Theory, he added, The erotic belongs on the one hand to the original drive nature of man. On the other hand, it is related to the highest forms of the spirit. It only thrives when spirit and drive are in harmony. Eros is a mighty diamond. As the wise Diotima says to Socrates, he is not all of nature within us, though he is at least one of its essential aspects. What is so interesting to note here in Jung's own words is his reference to Plato, at least in my opinion, how he says, on one hand and the other. Speaking on Plato, the footnote continues, In the symposium, Diotima teaches Socrates about the nature of Eros. She tells him that, he is a great spirit, Socrates. Everything classed as a spirit falls between God and human. What functions do they have? I asked. They interpret and carry messages from humans to gods and from gods to humans. They convey prayers and sacrifices from humans and commands and gifts in return for sacrifices from gods. Being intermediate between the other two, they fill the gap between them and enable the universe to form an interconnected whole. They serve as the medium for all divination, for priestly expertise in sacrifice, ritual, and spells, and for all prophecy and sorcery. Gods do not make direct contact with humans. 
They communicate and converse with humans, whether awake or asleep, entirely through the medium of spirits. In memories, Jung reflected on the nature of Eros, describing it as a cosmogonus, a creator and father-mother of all consciousness. This cosmonic characterization of Eros needs to be distinguished from Jung's use of the term to characterize woman's consciousness. To further expand, this Eros or erotic is the same as one's pleasures, desires, or in the highest term, love. In all, psychologically, the term libido may as well be the Eros function, or this devil god Jung is speaking on. The symbol of the flame flaring up and dying out is a wonderful illustration of this force of life. Jung says good and evil unite in the flame. And as we caught a glimpse of the great spirit of Eros from Diotima's teaching, say the good side, we see the opposite evil side in the Bhagavad Gita. As I read this short segment, keep in mind Jung's emphasis in Sermon 1 on remaining true to one's essence or nature. The Bhagavad Gita reads, One behaves according to one's own nature, even the one who knows his nature. All creatures follow their own nature. No one can stop that. Then what makes a man commit evil against his own will as if driven to it by force? It is desire. It is anger. And it arises from the condition of passion. While I can continue on about this essence of Eros, such as how we explored Jung's interactions and transformation of his own Eros in the Red Book series, there's another devil god to explore, that being the Tree of Life. From the emotional flame of passion and desire, we explore the slow greening tree. This greening is related to consciousness, as the Tree of Life is a symbol of one's own knowledge. For those familiar with the Kabbalah, this can be a reference to the Sephirat tree. Jung wrote about this tree, referring to it as the philosophical tree, throughout his collected works. In Alchemical Studies, he wrote, An image which frequently appears among the archetypal configurations of the unconscious is that of the tree or the wonder-working plant. When these fantasy products are drawn or painted, they very often fall into symmetrical patterns that take the form of a mandala. If a mandala may be described as a symbol of the self seen in cross-section, then the tree would represent a profile view of it, the self depicted as a process of growth. And in Mysterium Canotiones, he wrote, In the encounter with life in the world... There are experiences that are capable of moving us to long and thorough reflection, from which, in time, insights and convictions grow up, a process depicted by the alchemists as the philosophical tree. So, as Jung has told us in the previous sermons to embrace life, it is through this experience where one's tree grows, naturally. And of course, these experiences are both good and evil. As Jung says, good and evil unite in the tree. And as I did with Eros, we find the tree showing up in the Bhagavad Gita. I quote, There is an eternal fig tree, with its roots above and its branches below, and the Vedic hymns are its leaves. First downward and then upward spread its branches. They are nourished by the conditions of nature. Its sprouts are the sense objects. And below are its roots, which extend down into the world of men, all bound up with their actions. Its form cannot be perceived here as it really is, neither its end nor its beginning nor its foundation. This tree with its fully grown roots, one should cut it down with the strong axe of detachment. To that eternal place go the undiluted, those who have neither pride nor confusion who have overcome the harmful effects of attachment. They dwell on what relates to the self. They extinguish desire. They free themselves from the dualities that are experienced as pleasure and pain. This beautiful segment discusses two trees, an eternal one 
and another that should be cut down with a strong axe of detachment. The eternal tree, or say the self tree, is inverted, bearing fruit consciously and rooted in the eternal self, whereas the other tree is rooted in sense objects, one's own ego attachments and false opinions and beliefs, binding one to their own illusion. So just as with Eros, I could go on forever about the symbolism of the tree, but I will bring these two devil gods together in an image with what we have learned thus far in the sermons. We remember the three levels of reality, both creation and eternity with a space in between. Psychologically, creation represents consciousness, the in-between, the subconscious, and eternity represents the collective unconscious. While the ego is in creation, and say the true self in eternity, Jung places these devil gods in between as a medium, just as Plato outlines as he writes on Diotima's teachings to Socrates. We remember the quote from the Bhagavad Gita of the tree having its roots upward, inverted towards eternity, and blossoming consciously in creation. Without the roots grounded in reality, in what is, in the truth, one will continue to distort reality with their own maya, the tree and desires bound up in their own illusion. It is in one subconscious where everything is being carried through consciousness, and it is in the space of the subconscious where one subjective psyche transforms. Again, if it happened in consciousness, one would choose to transform today, but it takes time, hence growing the tree slowly. And finally, with these two devil gods, I think it's very important that Jung mentions them together, as they seem to be connected. I personally would say that one's libido is dependent on its roots or its knowledge, and one's own roots or beliefs and knowledge is dependent on one's libido. If one's eros is tied up in illusions of desires, pleasures, and attachments, like the Bhagavad Gita quote, then the tree will never green or grow. Its roots would wither. On the other hand, if one's eros is functioning according to nature, the tree will grow and blossom, naturally. And on the flip side, if the tree is built up on false beliefs and opinions, the libido will desire such pursuits. And if one's tree is built up on true understanding and experience, then the libido will not be tied up in such false desire. Now after this long pause, we continue back in Sermon 4. As Jung says, The number of gods and devils is as innumerable as the host of stars. Each star is a god. And each space that a star fills is a devil. But the empty fullness of the whole is the pleroma. Abraxas is the effective whole. Only the ineffective opposes him. Four is the number of the principal gods, as four is the number of the world's measurements. One is the beginning, the god. Two is Eros, for he spreads himself out in brightness. Three is the tree of life, for it fills space with bodies. Four is the devil, for he opens all that is closed. He dissolves everything formed and physical. He is the destroyer in whom everything becomes nothing. The dead respond, You are a pagan, a polytheist. Here, after Jung provides a bit of a summary on Abraxas and the Pleroma, he brings together the four gods or archetypes of life. As it is Sermon 4, and he refers to the number 4 as the number of the world's measurements, it is important to remember an idea that Jung wrote about throughout his collected works. The Quaternio is a unity of 4. Pairs of 4s can be seen everywhere in creation, from the 4 basic elements of fire, water, air, and earth, to the 4 cardinal directions, the 4 Seasons, the four Gospels, the four Vedas, the four noble truths, Jung's four basic functions of consciousness and personality types, and the list goes on. As for these four archetypes, I'll expand on each essence. 
First, God or the Son represents the highest good and fullness. Secondly, Eros represents the libido or life force. Third, the tree of life symbolizes the essence of understanding or knowledge. And finally, the fourth is the devil representing the essence of evil, emptiness, and destruction. Again, they're all real forces in life and they're all collective so we can all reflect on each essence. Jung continues, Happy am I who can recognize the multiplicity and diversity of the gods, but woe unto you who replace the incompatible multiplicity with a single god. In so doing, you produce the torment of doubt for the sake of the one god and the mutilation of the creation whose nature and aim is differentiation. How could you be true to your own nature when you try to turn the many into one? What you do unto the gods is done likewise unto you. You all become equal, and thus your nature is maimed. Equality prevails not for the sake of God, but only for the sake of men. For the gods are many, while men are few. The gods are mighty and endure their manifoldness. Like the stars, they abide in eternal solitude, separated by vast distances. Men are weak and do not bear their manifoldness. Therefore, they dwell together closely and need communion so that they can bear their singularity. This is such an important part in the sermon as Jung explains why it's essential to separate and grasp the essence of each God or archetype. If one just says everything is of the highest God, then they lose a grip on life. And hence, as Jung says, one loses their nature. If all these gods and archetypes are active within all, then they are a part of our nature. And if they are a part of our nature, then one has a choice to either remain ignorant or become aware of the wholeness of one's essence. Now at this point in the Black Books, Jung's entry on the 3rd of February ends, but the sermons pick back up two days later on February 5th. The dead continue, for redemption's sake, continue to teach us. Jung continues Sermon 4, For redemption's sake, I teach you the reprehensible, for whose sake I was rejected. The multiplicity of the gods corresponds to the multiplicity of men. Numberless gods await the human state. Numberless gods have been men. Man shares in the nature of the gods. He comes from the gods and goes unto the god. Thus, just as it is no use to reflect upon the pleroma, it is not worthwhile to worship the multiplicity of the gods. Least of all does it serve to worship the first god, the effective fullness, and the sunum bonum. By our prayer, we add nothing to it and take nothing from it, because effective emptiness gulps down everything. Now, before I get into a dagger in the hearts of the religious type, I do want to say quickly, if you take that first section and replace gods with archetypes, it reads rather interestingly. Also with this section, notice how Jung says one comes from the gods or archetypes and then goes unto the God. Now this is the one God in Greek terms or the self or Brahman in the Bhagavad Gita. And this is not an allusion to Abraxas. Again, Abraxas is a one God in creation. But as we know, this cosmology extends reality beyond space and time. Now the dagger for the religious type is a reference to Jung's idea that worshiping and prayer can add nothing or take nothing from the gods. What I would like to add is while prayer and worshiping may not add anything to the gods, it may be a first step in taming one's ego away from its bounds and illusions. But again, this is something that needs to be left behind if one really wants to connect with thyself as the self does it need prayer? Does it need worshiping? That already is. And what you could do is understand the archetypes, understand what is, understand the monads that create reality from eternity. So while it's not a prayer or worship that Jung's saying one should have towards the gods, it is an understanding and differentiation. Now, as we head back to Sermon 4 in the Black Books, Jung takes a break from this teaching 
and begins speaking to a dark form who approaches with knowledge of the Eastern Way. I will save this for the conclusion of the video as it ties into the content of this sermon. After this discussion with the dark form from the East, the sermon in Black Book 6 concludes, The bright gods form the heavenly world. It is manifold and extends and increases indefinitely. The spiritual sun is the supreme lord of the world. The dark gods form the earthly world. They are simple and they lessen and diminish themselves indefinitely. Their nethermost lord, namely the devil, is the moon spirit, satellite of the earth, smaller and colder than earth. There is no difference between the might of the heavenly and earthly gods. The heavenly gods magnify, the earthly gods diminish. Both directions are immeasurable. Jung concludes with the duality of the gods, specifically the brightest gods of the heavenly world and dark gods of the earthly world. Each forms their corresponding world with equal might and direction, one in fullness and the other emptiness. And finally, each essence has their own lord, as Jung names it, as the sun and devil. And with this, the Sermon in the Black Books has concluded. At this point, we will pick things back up in the Red Book as Philemon and Jung continue on with a powerful post-sermon discussion. The Red Book post-sermon discussion. Jung turns to Philemon after the sermon and said, O oh, Philemon, I believe you are mistaken. It seems that you reach a raw superstition which the fathers had successfully and gloriously overcome. That polytheism which a mind produces only when it cannot free its gaze from the force of compulsive desire chained to sensory things. Before Philemon responds, I do want to add that this refers directly to the quote from the Bhagavad Gita about that tree, not the self tree, but say the ego tree, that one must cut down with its roots attached to sensory objects. Now back to the Red Book as Philemon responds, My son, these dead have rejected the single and highest God. So how can I teach them about the one, only, and not multifarious God? They must, of course, believe me, but they have rejected their belief. So I teach them the God that I know, the multifarious and extended, who is both the thing and its appearance. And they also know him even if they are not conscious of him. These dead have given names to all beings, the beings in the air, on the earth, and in the water. They have weighed and counted things. They have counted so and so many horses, cows, sheep, trees, segments of land and springs. They said, this is good for this purpose, and that is good for that one. What did they do with the admirable tree? What happened to the sacred frog? Did they see his golden eye? Where is the atonement for the 7,777 cattle whose blood they spilled, whose flesh they consumed? Did they do penance for the sacred ore that they dug up from the belly of the earth? No. They named, weighed, numbered, and apportioned all things. They did whatever pleases them. And what did they do? You saw the powerful. But this is precisely how they gave power to things unknowingly. Yet the time has come when things speak. The piece of flesh says, how many men? The piece of ore says, how many men? The ship says, how many men? The coal says, how many men? The house says, how many men? And things rise and number and weigh and apportion and devour millions of men. Your hand grasped the earth and tore off the halo and weighed and numbered the bones of things. Is not the one and only simple-minded God pulled down and thrown onto a heap, the massed seeming of separate things dead and living? Yes, this God taught you to weigh and number bones, but the month of this God is drawing to a close. A new month stands at the door. Therefore, everything had to be as it is, and hence everything must become different. 
I let Philemon go a bit to see if you can catch what he's alluding to. I absolutely love this section as Philemon is truly pushing a new age of consciousness. When one lives in a consciousness of belief, one is never able to truly understand what is. And as the previous age was an age of image and belief, Jung saying that this age is both the image and the essence. And you can see why so much essence is spoken on throughout the sermons. Now speaking on the new age of consciousness, Philemon focuses in on the idea of naming. And I believe this is the pure gold of this section, but it requires some commentary to grasp. To name something is a rather important function, and this naming will be directly related to the tree of life. Naming requires a tremendous amount of awareness and respect for nature, as one is putting an image on an essence. And since essence is always invisible, we must use an image to point to its reality. The problem, and I mean a huge problem, is when the naming loses its respect, when the image is what one wants or imagines or believes rather than what it is. And in this mislabeling of essence, consciousness suffers. The tree is a complete chaotic mess. And you see Philemon's disgust by what the people have done to their beliefs and opinions. They've truly disrespected both nature and their very own self. The most important point to highlight in this section is the moment where Philemon says that because of this complete disrespect for reality, for eternity, for what is, they have given power to things. Inanimate things have become animated, and so animated that one's libido gets all tied up in it. The illusion becomes someone's reality. This is so powerful to reflect on. Philemon continues, These dead laugh at my foolishness, but would they have raised a murderer's hand against their brothers if they had atoned for the ox with the velvet eyes? If they had done penance for the shiny ore? If they had worshipped the holy trees? If they had made peace with the soul of the golden-eyed frogs? What say things dead and living? Who is greater, man or the gods? Truly this sun has become a moon, and no new sun has arisen from the contradictions of the last hour of the night. And when he had finished these words, Philemon bent down to the earth, kissed it, and said, Mother, may your son be strong. Then he stood, looked up at the heavens, and said, How dark is your place of the new light? Then he disappeared. Now with that, the red book section has concluded, but as I said, I do want to go back to the black books with the section where a dark form from the east visits Jung. It's powerful, and I believe it connects directly with all that was spoken of in Sermon 4. Conclusion We conclude this sermon in black book 6 as the dark figure approached Jung in the middle of the sermon. I place this text here as it is in alignment with both individuation and the ideas set forth about attachments. Again, it is attachments that bind both Eros and the Tree of Life into illusion. And it is just this topic of which the Dark Form speaks on. The Dark Form from the East says, My skin is dark and the white of my eyes shine. I bring you the Eastern Way. Jung. What is that? Abstinence. Abstinence from what? From man. What? Enhanced solitude? No. Abstinence from man. Abstinence from human joy and suffering. Is that Eastern wisdom? The dark form. You need it. It belongs to being one among the many. You hear the word attachment. Don't you see that it reaches over into the life and essence of the other? You fall from the path and you draw the other from the path. Compassion, but no attachment. Compassion with the cosmos. A will towards the individual held in check. Attachment leads to alienation. Compassion remains misunderstood. Therefore it works. Not wanting to understand, but letting it work. I come to you 
since the primordial binds us together. Surrender and abstinence, little talk and simple action. Far from longing, no, no fear. Far from love, love the whole, free from fallacy. Slow growth saves the individual and creates a people. Jung, why are you as dark as the earth of the fields? I am afraid of you. Such pain. What have you done to me? The dark form. I am the death that rose with the sun. I come with quiet pain and long peace. I lay the cover of protection over you. In the mists of life begins death. I lay cover upon cover on you, so that your warmth will never cease. Yong, you bring grief and despair. I want it to be among men. The dark form. You will go to men as one veiled. Your light shines at night. Your solar nature departs from you, and your star begins. Yong, you are cruel. The dark form. The simple is cruel since it does not unite with the manifold. Jung, I understand you. I want to be simple. So with these final thoughts to ponder in Black Book 6, thoughts that allude to the Eastern idea of ego death, we conclude Sermon 4. In the next sermon, the dead return, and Jung provides an interesting teaching on the manifestations of gods, which take the shape and the essence of sexuality and spirituality. I want to thank you for all the continued support on these sermons and kindly ask you to like, comment, and share the videos to help get the information out. Until next time, stay humble.